Hiya friends, and welcome back to Toto, the doggone amazing story of the Wizard of Oz by Michael Morpurgo and Emma Ch Chichester Clark. Sorry, Emma Chichester Clark did the amazing illustrations, and Michael Morpurgo wrote the story from Toto's point of view, which means through his eyes. So we know the story from L. Frank Baum, who was the narrator, who, um, and that, that's called like a third person narrative, which means that the narrator knows everything that's happening and can tell us all the thoughts and feelings of every character. This is going to be Toto interpreting what happens. It's his perspective, his, his view of things. So the first thing we're going to visit, we did a prologue and we set it all up, and this is being read by Toto to his children. And um, Tiny Toto, I think it was, right? Tiny Toto, is that the name? Yes, Tiny Toto is the one that always stays through to the end. And the beginning of the tale about the Wizard of Oz, oh, sorry, Wizard of Oz, <laughs> sorry, is I was there. And when you hear that, Tiny Toto's ears perk up. I'm super excited. Okay, so this is going to be a little different than the Wizard of Oz, because this is Toto's version of the story. Let's begin. Chapter 1, A Giant Monster of a Twister I was lying right here, deep in my dreams in this very basket, when I was woken up by the sound of the wind roaring and howling around the house, rattling the doors and windows, shaking the whole place. I never heard a wind like it. The door blew open, so I got up and went outside. Everyone was rushing around. Dorothy trying to shut the hens in the hen house? But they were skittering about all over the place. So Dorothy's trying to get those hens in the hen house and everybody's rushing around her. They didn't want to go inside, of course. They didn't. It wasn't getting dark yet. The hens never go to bed before dark. What was Dar Dorothy thinking of? Uncle Henry was driving the cattle into the barn, but they didn't want to go in either. And he was calling for me to come and help him. But I had sleep still in my head and didn't want to. Anyway, he was managing well enough on his own, I thought, without me. Aunt Em was trying to shut the barn doors, but the wind wouldn't let her. She was blown off her feet and went rolling over and over like tumbleweed. Dorothy saw what was happening, left her hens and ran to help Aunt Em up on her feet. And together with Uncle Henry, they managed to shut the barn door. Then they did some more chasing round, getting old Barney, our plow horse, into a stable, rounding up the pigs, and that wasn't easy either. And all the while they were hollering at each other about a great storm coming in, and how the clouds were dark in the north, and how that was a bad sign. If I'm not mistaken, there's a twister on the way, Uncle Henry was bellowing, or else I'll eat my hat. And then suddenly he didn't have any hat on his head anymore. It had blown away. So I went after it. I love a good old hat chase, especially when there's a wind blowing over the prairies in Kansas. As Uncle Henry often says, Maybe other folks in other places invented the wheel and writing and all that smart stuff, but in Kansas, we invented the wind. Anyways, I went chasing that hat of Uncle Henry's just about all over Kansas and caught up with it down by the creek where it landed in the water, and I dived right in, grabbed it in my teeth, and trotted it back home, head high, tail high, pretty darn pleased with myself. I've always been like that. If I'm chasing after something, hats especially, I put just about everyone and everything else out of my mind. But now the chase was over, and I could hear Dorothy screaming for me to come home. I could see her now, standing on the veranda of the farmhouse, and right behind her, and nearly right above her, came this giant monster of a twister, just a-roaring and a-raging, towering up into the sky, taking the barn with it, making splinters of it, and the fences too, and the rain tub, swirling and swallowing everything. Well, I ran. I took the steps up the veranda in one bound, jumped right into Dorothy's arms. Where have you been, Toto? she cried, hugging me to her, and running into the house. I showed her the hat in my mouth, shook it for her to be quite sure she noticed how smart I had been. You rescued Uncle Henry's hat. I was so pleased that she was pleased. You are such a smart Toto. 
Don't you drop it now. We got to get ourselves safe out of the storm or else we'll be blowed to smithereens. Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are waiting for us down in the cellar, but I couldn't really leave you behind, could I? I ain't going down there without Toto, I told them. And now I got you. That's where we're going right now. I know you don't like it down in the dark, Toto, but it's safe down there. So like it or lump it, you're coming with me. She was right. I hated it down in that cellar. Never did like the dark, still don't. I could see the trap door open on the far side of the room. I could hear Aunt Em and Uncle Henry hollering for us to hurry up. Dorothy managed to get the front door shut against the wind, with the house shaking all around us. Shaking so bad, I thought that old Twister was going to make splinters of it any moment. Cups and saucers, jugs and plates, smashed onto the floor. Drawers flew open, knives and forks and spoons, kettles and pots and pans, rattled and crashed, chairs and cupboards and dressers tipped over. I was never so scared in my life. We were halfway across the room when the strangest thing happened. The trap door slammed itself shut, and all of a sudden, the shaking and the roaring, the whistling and wailing, simply stopped. I heard Aunt Em and Uncle Henry still calling for us from down below in the cellar, but their voices were becoming fainter with every moment. Then all was silence. The whole house was swaying now, and we were swaying with it. Dorothy fell on her knees, but never let go of me. She crawled to her bed in the corner, and we curled up there, holding on to one another, wondering what had happened, what was going to happen. We're floating, Toto, Dorothy cried. Floating on the air right in the middle of the twister. We're flying, Toto, she called out for Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. But there was no reply. See the house there in the corner? Right there. Right at the top of the twister. We're all alone, Dorothy said, her voice trembling a bit. But don't you worry, nun. I'll look after you, Toto. You know I will. And I did know that, so I wasn't worried. Not as much as I had been, anyway. There was blue sky outside the window now, and we were flying up and out of the clouds. There was hardly a sound. I wasn't frightened at all anymore. I did feel a little sick, though, what with all this floating around in the air, especially when the house lurched and tipped and rocked about. We'd best lie down, Toto, said Dorothy, and close our eyes. Then we'll feel better. So that's what we did, and pretty soon, what with all that gentle swaying and rocking, we were both of us fast asleep, her arm around me, my head in her lap, Uncle Henry's hat right beside me. She told me to look after his hat, so that's just what I was doing. And that is the end of Chapter 1 of Toto doggone amazing story of the Wizard of Oz. Now, there's one major difference between the Wizard of Oz that I read before and this book. And you know what it is? Because they're telling the story from Toto's point of view, there's a lot more detail. Right? A lot more detail. Like he's going on and on about a hat. So now we know why Toto wasn't ready to um, come to the storm cellar. He was chasing after Uncle Henry's hat. That's something that L. Frank Baum kind of neglected in the book. So it's interesting. And then another thing that's happening is um, the way they're speaking. L. L. Frank Baum kind of forgot or didn't include like the way people would speak in that, like there's more more of a dialect going on there, more of the accent, I guess you would say. You know how we're from Jersey, and um, when we talk, people say we have a Jersey accent, or they pretend to not understand us sometimes. Well, that's kind of what um, happens in other parts of the country, in the United States. From state to state, there's different accents. And in Kansas, there's a distinct accent and a way of speaking especially back in this time, um, like doggone and ain't, those kind of uh, things you hear. Well, I hope you enjoyed it, and tomorrow, or the next time we read this, which will probably be tomorrow, we'll be reading Chapter 2, Landing in the Land of the Munchkins. And another great thing about this book is the illustrations are top-notch. I think Emma Chester Clark did a fabulous job illustrating this book. I hope you're enjoying it. I'm excited to read more, 
and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.